I never really blamed him, I blamed myself. And that self-blame over time became a kind of self-hatred. Powerful first words from Michael Mack. In this podcast, we take you with Michael on his journey of forgiveness. You're listening to Conversations with His Molester, a documentary podcast series from Capital Broadcasting Company. I'm documentary producer Clay Johnson. This four-part series is a companion to the WREL documentary, Speaking the Unspeakable. We'll tell you more about that at the end of this episode. I'm going to start with a warning. This is a story about child sexual abuse, so it's not suitable for children. Somehow we were both able to forgive our attackers. In Speaking the Unspeakable, we tell the stories of stepbrothers Knight Chamberlain and Michael Mack. Both of them were sexually abused as children while living in Brevard, North Carolina in the 1960s. Knight by a stranger, Michael by his priest. They both say they've healed their wounds and forgiven their attackers. Michael's path to forgiveness, though, was an incredible journey, a journey to have a conversation with his molester. I was an altar boy, a certified knight of the altar, and I knelt head down, chin to sternum, watching the shoes of the priest polish the path to salvation. That's Michael acting in a play he wrote, produced, and performs. He lives outside Boston now. You'll find out later how the priest who molested him ended up living nearby. Meantime, Michael's play and his journey start with his love of the Catholic Church his family attended while living just outside of Washington, D.C. I wanted to be a priest because I had a natural, like, spiritual sensibility, I think. But also, priests were special. Um, Everybody looked up to priests. They were uh, Jesus' representatives on earth, God's representatives on earth. I could see just how special priests were. And I could see it most especially when I was serving as an altar boy or when I was a choir boy during the Mass, which is really the high point. When he was 10, Michael's father sent him and his siblings to live with a relative in Brevard for a year. They attended the local Catholic church. One Sunday after Mass, Michael went down to the church's basement where Sunday school was held. I was fooling around with some of the toys. I was... um, breaking crayons, I was sniffing from the Play-Doh can, uh, just making a nuisance of myself. And then I saw that there was a piano shoved up against the wall, an old upright piano, and so I started playing on it. And while I was playing the piano, um, I looked up and I saw that Father Gordon was in the doorway. So I said, hi. And he said hi back and commented on my playing. Father Gordon isn't his real name. It's a name Michael invented. In telling his story to us and to the public through his play, Michael wanted to protect the real priest's identity. Not so much to protect the man he calls Father Gordon, but to protect the priest's family. They, after all, were not the ones who committed a crime. At this point in Michael's life, Father Gordon had become a family friend. Michael's dad, if you remember, was living near D.C. He was only coming down a couple of times a month. Father Gordon had stepped in as a father figure to Michael. He even took Michael to his first basketball game. Father Gordon was now standing in the doorway of the church basement where Michael had been playing piano. He told Michael he was upstairs making costumes for an Easter play, and he made Michael an offer he really couldn't refuse. He invited me to come up to the rectory and help him, and I was thrilled to do that because I wanted to be helpful. So Michael followed Father Gordon up to the rectory. Inside, the father was using bed sheets to make shepherd's costumes. And so he asked me to undress, and so I did. And then he took the sheet and he wrapped it around my legs and tied it with a safety pin. That's when things started to feel really weird to me. He wanted to make sure that I had enough room and so he asked me uh, to sit on the bed and um, that he could help if um, I pretended that he was a girl. And that was the first moment that I knew something was terribly wrong because 
I was in sixth grade and no boy I knew kissed girls. So this guy that I thought I knew and I thought was a friend of mine, it became in that instant, um, this was something really different. Michael didn't go into explicit details about just what Father Gordon did in our interview with him, and he only hints at it in his play. You want to name this, but to say it is to put it in your mouth. Any details more explicit than that really don't matter. What matters is that Father Gordon sexually molested Michael. It also matters that child sexual abuse is both immoral and illegal. And I don't know how long I was there. It seemed like forever. He said that this was gonna be a secret between us and uh, that I was very special. And so I needed to keep this secret. And so he gave me a quarter and asked me I, what I might buy with it. And I told him a, a fried pie. And then he opened the door and he ushered me out. And I went back outside to my bike. And I felt like something, like I was completely different now. Something was completely different about me because something completely different just happened that I had no words for, couldn't explain or understand. And I didn't know what sense to make of it. And because I had wanted, ever since I could remember, wanted to be a priest, I wondered if this was something that priests knew, that this secret was something that something special that priests had, and I didn't know what to do with that. I just felt really weird and giddy, and I didn't know what to say or do. So I did the only thing that I knew for sure how to do, and that's jump on my bike and just start pedaling away as fast as I could. And I felt like I just wanted to pedal to the other side of the world. As Michael acts out in his play, Pumping the pedals hard as I could. Pedal, pedal, pedal till my face burned. Pedal, pedal, pedal till it hurt to breathe. Michael didn't pedal to the other side of the world, but his father did take him back to the D.C. area several months later. And later in this series, you'll find out that Father Gordon wasn't Michael's only molester when he was a child living for a year in Brevard. You'll also find out how that ties into his journey to find Father Gordon. But Michael's journey really started with what Father Gordon did to him in the church rectory. And keeping it a secret is what made it such a long and bumpy ride. And it's not a secret that I wanted to share um, with anybody until I understood it better. It's not something that I could tell, that I felt like I could tell anybody for a lot of reasons. Um, and because there was something dark about it, something hidden about it, something uh, fearful about it, and something very, that made me feel very vulnerable about it. I felt like it started to grow inside of me. There were triggers that would bring it all to the surface, triggers that would take him back to that Sunday afternoon in the rectory. One of those triggers was the word suck. So if somebody used that word just in casual conversation, I couldn't hear it without feeling kind of sick and feeling exposed and feeling like maybe even people could see inside me. People could see inside my mind and know what I was thinking, know what I was feeling and know what I was remembering. Even though in a lot of ways I lived a childhood that was pretty normal on the outside, on the inside it felt like there was something really wrong with me and really bad about me. I never really blamed him, I blamed myself. And that self-blame over time became a kind of self-hatred. Self-hatred turned to shame and guilt, and that led to depression and substance abuse. It's a fairly typical path for a child who's been sexually abused, especially if that child keeps it a secret, and especially if that secret is kept for a long, long time. The way to begin to heal about it is to talk about it. Later in this series, we'll tell you how Michael eventually made the decision to talk about it, to us, to others, and to the public through his play. 
and we'll take you on the journey that led him there in the next three episodes of Conversations with His Molester. This podcast was produced by Capital Broadcasting Company and edited by Jay Jennings. We thank Michael Mack for giving us permission to use excerpts from his play to help tell his story. We hope you'll join us for episode two in the series, Conversations with His Molester. You can find it where you found this episode. Subscribe to get all four. And to see more of Michael's story and walk his journey of forgiveness with his stepbrother, Knight, who was also the victim of child sexual abuse, watch the documentary Speaking the Unspeakable on WRALDocumentary.com. I'm WRAL documentary producer Clay Johnson. Thanks for listening.